everybody, and welcome to Refresh, a time to connect, be inspired, learn something new, and, you know, ultimately feel a bit better for this time we spend together. After all, this is what Generation W is all about. I have to tell you just how much I love our community. I do hope you brought some friends today. We talked about that last week, the more the merrier, because it seems like uh, there are some new things that we can be cheering for beginning this week. And I know we are all looking for those positives. I, and you would not be surprised, I'm truly excited that the WNBA season will be starting. Yes, this week on Saturday, the New York Liberty will be playing the Seattle Storm at noon. Um, I don't know, I guess check your local listings, we'll find what that is, but I'm pretty excited about that. And tomorrow, if you're a baseball fan, Tomorrow is opening day for baseball. You got to admit, July opening day, but that is the world we're living in and uh, okay with that. I have to tell you, last night I had the privilege of co-hosting a Maccabi USA sports show and we had the most amazing guest, kind of like the one we have today. Uh, Mark Wilf is the owner of the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, it was great to talk to him and he expressed a great deal of confidence that the NFL will be playing soon as well. So for all you football fans, that is coming soon. Also delighted, delighted by the new star started ownership team for the new NWSL, the North American Women's Soccer League. So there is a new professional women's soccer league. So I love to see the growth. And I love to see these names associated with that growth in the ownership position. Natalie Portman, actress. Alexis Ohanian, Eva Longoria, Mia Hamm, Abby Wambach, Julie Foudy, Jennifer Gardner, Jennifer Chastain. And that's among a, a, a much bigger group. The team's going to be called Angel City. And I say to their commissioner, Lisa Baird, you go, girl. Let's keep building all of these great things. And as life gives... It also takes, and I have to tell you that COVID, as we all know, continues to spread. The death rates now are continuing to go up. Please, let's all be safe. Let's wear masks and let's take care of you. Remember what our doc said last week, Dr. Thielen and, and Dr. Stephanie, right? Don't apologize for taking care of ourselves first. It's really important. Um, take care of those you love. And those that you don't know, but you probably would love if you did, which is why we all agreed to collectively as a community wear masks and do the right thing for each other. I think about my parents all the time, right? I, I want them to be well. And I think all of us do. Um, I am particularly touched and saddened by the passing this past week of Congressman John Lewis. He was a man who stood up with pride and with dignity, was knocked down and stood up again. His work for social justice was work that dignified us all. His work remains about our collective freedom. And it was as Abraham Lincoln said, those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Again, we are all in this together. I had the chance to meet him. I was notified many years ago that I was being awarded an honorary doctorate by the very special Adelphi University in New York. I was quite surprised and I was deeply honored, of course, but to ultimately find out that I would be honored alongside Congressman John Lewis was honestly beyond the scope of my comprehension. Uh, yes, I felt definitely um, part of that imposter syndrome, but there we were. We were on the bus together, we we're sitting up front next to each other, side by side. I actually crossed the aisle and I was so excited and I actually wasn't sure what to say. Yes, it was me. I wasn't sure what to say because I so respected this man. The journey he traveled, the work that he had done, the work that he was doing, where he sat. And uh, I was profoundly touched by his presence. And so, you know, of course, I talked a little bit about basketball. We had a new team in Atlanta. He engaged, he was reserved, he was warm. He was John Lewis. And he will always be someone, I believe, who will shine a light on what we can do and what we must do to help our country be all that it can be. <sighs> Rest in peace, John Lewis. And may we carry on his legacy of good work. And as I was preparing this morning, Sherry Levin, our wonderful producer, asked if I was going to say it was good to be back. 
And I'm like, where was I? And I remembered, I did manage to sneak away with our family for a week in Colorado. But as I thought of it, it kind of made me laugh. Because you see, I had my screen with me. And I did the show from Colorado, and no one would really know unless I said something, which I did. But the new normal is just a ubiquitous screen that follows us everywhere, or we take it with us everywhere. It's the expectation of how we're going to connect. So I thought it was really fitting that today we welcome a communications expert, an astounding, wonderful, smart person and friend who understands how to amplify both the medium and the message. And as the medium, screens have become such a part of our life, how to utilize these screens to really help us communicate and connect in a much better way is something I think we all could very much benefit from. Her name is Erica Dewan. Woo! She's accomplished. I'm a regular follower of her work, her blog, and of her because she is the mom of two very young children and facing what we're all facing in this new normal, trying to figure out a world where she delivered a lot of her work in person giving talks. And now, of course, that's been kind of turned upside down. So Erica, hello, how are you? So glad to be with you. Let's start out by asking like, how are you managing? What is your strategy, new mom, new career in a new normal? How are you doing this? First of all, Donna, hello everyone, Gen W community. I'm so excited to be with you over this refresh chat. How am I uh, coping, managing, um, handling our new normal? I would say, uh, I'll, I'll give a little context. So um, in, uh, I'll describe it in sort of our four parts of our lives. Um, my home life, I had my second child in February five weeks before shutdown, I said to myself, oh, everything's going to be better about six weeks after I deliver my baby post my C-section. And then, you know, everything happened in the way it was. And I was displaced from my home in New York City for three months, which was hard with such a small infant and a toddler. On the work front, um, I'm a professional a keynote speaker and author. Uh, and really my um, if my home's life's mission is to be a mother, my work's mission is really to speak and to bring the ideas around connectivity to audiences. Uh, and that got flipped um, in, in the world of COVID where really I'm in the gatherings business and gatherings got canceled. Um, and, you know, also from, I would call it self or family life, um, having to move two times and being displaced from my home um, when I was just recovering from a C-section has really turned things um, to a completely different environment. And I would say in many ways, the last four months, um, I've been tested. I've been tested as, um, as a leader, as a mother, as a human being, as a wife, as a daughter. Uh, and it's really had me ask myself um, this question of what, what's in my power? And how can I shift my own mindset um, to remind us that there is no destination? Um, we have to be in our moment and here now. And I always thought, finally, when I'm done being pregnant and delivering my two kids, everything will be better. Or finally, when I do enough keynotes, everything will be better. Um, but these past few months have reminded me that I, that the most powerful thing we can do is be here now in the moment and assess what's the joy that we can have in this moment. And so to summarize, I would say there, Donna, should I share maybe some of the things I've learned about how I have to lead myself right now? Yeah, let's talk about this. Cause I, I, you know, listen, it sounds like you really obviously think about these things. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's the first thing we should talk about. All of us have variations on the theme of being displaced, Yeah. right? Our minds might be displaced because we have to deal, even though we're sitting in this chair, right? We're all over the place, right? So yes, as I am feeling displaced, a little unsettled, how do I lead myself? Yeah. So there are a few things that um, I've been working on because we are all works in progress on this, but that have helped me and helped a lot of my clients and large organizations, executives, managers of teams to really lead themselves in our new normal. The first, and I'll summarize it in three different tips. The first okay. tip is to really focus on what we can control. 
what can we control? We can control our mindsets and our attitudes. And I have to tell you, when I stopped focusing on the fact that gatherings were canceled and I was worried about my keynote business flopping or um, that my kids weren't going to sleep as we you know, were in a new environment, and I focused on what can I control. I can control the mindset I bring to the day. I can control uh, having a gratitude journal and writing three things that I'm grateful for. I can control thinking about what have been some of the most positive outcomes of this difficult period. And for me, it's things like being able to speak from a virtual screen and not having to travel and be away from my kids. Or frankly, um, right now, you know, having this unique time to really be with my family and my husband being home more often than he would traveling. Uh, so, so, uh, you know, to really summarize that, just a simple action that I've been taking is writing down three things I'm grateful for in the morning and a quick affirmation of, you know, what's in my power and what can I control. And for me right now, that's been a mantra that I've been using that I call, I am healthy and wealthy. And for me, health is mind, body, spirit, and wealth is the freedom to be able to think with an abundant mindset. It's not about finances. Second, my second tip, uh, I would say it's wait, wait, that was all your first tip. Yeah, that was my I first already tip. have a page of notes, and that's so amazing. But the, the, before you go on, hold on, yeah. hold on. Okay, so uh, your health is your mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and spirit. Okay, last week, just so you know, you probably missed us, but we had these wonderful uh doctors, Dr. Thielen and Dr. Fabian from the Mayo Clinic. So we're into health. And the wealth is, say this again, I think this is so poignant. So, you know, wealth for me, I, I like to describe it as um, the, an, a, having an abundant mindset. Abundant uh, mindset. And the freedom to be able to thoughtfully choose how I spend my time and choose how I think about how I spend my time. So, no, it, so it's, it's a declaration of intention. Yes. Okay, I love that. Okay, that's number one, everybody. Because our intentions are what we create. Um, and all of you that um, have had those experiences in, the, your, in your life, you know what I'm talking about. And even if you're going through a challenging period, um, sometimes we have to sit through that challenge, but shift our mindset. So, so that was number one, focus on what you can control. Okay, now, before you go, number one, hold on. I know you're excited. Um, and part of what you can control includes a writing a gratitude journal. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna go into number two, but before we do that, I wanna pr practice gratitude right now. Can I do that, please? Absolutely. I'm grateful for you that you're here, of course, but I'm also grateful for, here's Tara telling, hi, Erin, and Heidi Hanna, who's on a walk in San Diego, I believe. Chantel, Karen Friedman, Sue Renners, who's up in San Francisco. Chris Reese is our official love partner. He's with us all the time, we love him. Barry, I think Barry's in from the West Coast. Agnes, Brig Brigitte from Ghana. Of course, we have Joy. Jackie's back, our doctor, she'll, she'll be able to check in on us. Um, this Don joined us and Trisha Melly. We have all these people just joining us and I am grateful for all of them. I also would love to invite any, all of that, all of you watching either on Zoom or on Facebook. As you're talking, I want people to pay attention. But uh, think about at some point, they'll share with us maybe something they're grateful to, for too. So we can engage them in this gratitude journaling because that's always a nice thing to share, right? Okay, number two. Number two, uh, and this one has really helped me. I'm a big fan of visioning or you know, setting some time to think about what you hope to achieve in the future. But I did an exercise that my mentor, Marshall Goldsmith, um, suggested to me that really helped me to lead myself right now. And that exercise was answering this specific question. And the question is, a year from now, what would I be proud of that of having done in this moment? So whether it's you taking 10 minutes, 10 minutes today or tomorrow to just be alone by yourself, go outside if you have nature around you and close your eyes and imagine and Imagine your future self in one year, um, who she is, who he is, what you're doing, and ask that future self, what am I proud of that you did in this moment of time now, one year before? 
Uh, and sometimes when we, when we step our, outside of ourselves, um, we can get back to what really matters. And when I did this exercise, I thought, you know, when I normally do my one year plans, I say, oh, I want to um, sell more virtual keynotes and grow my business and have right. my book become a bestseller next year. But when I did this exercise and I asked my future self, what am I proud of that I did in this moment? It was. Um, Eric, I'm proud that you were kind and compassionate to yourself. I'm proud that you gave um, time not to jump into things or be triggered or reactive, but uh, sit in the discomfort and gain some inner guidance and wisdom. And, and just sort of flipping our questions from having, say, an action plan to, um, to tapping into some of our inner wisdom, um, what's always been in us, but sometimes we don't have the space for in a world of screen fatigue and constant work. Wow, that is so bad. There, I think Barry's on the phone, and it's funny because Barry, he, he did this exercise with me, when, but he did it, wasn't a year from now, 20 years from now, he said. If you yeah. look back, what would you be most proud of? Yeah. And that single question, which I think about all the time, keeps me very focused on this community, Generation W, and the work that we're doing and having you be here um, as being the most essential, right, soul-fulfilling kind of connectivity and work. So that's, that is really powerful. All right. Last number, tip. Number three. Uh, my last tip is to use what I call your connectional intelligence. Now, okay. some of you heard me speak at Gen W two years ago, I talked about my last book, which is on the topic of connectional intelligence. Uh, and I really define that as in a world that is not just connected, but over connected. How do we really master the quality of our connections that allow ways to allow us to create greater value and meaning from our connections? And one of the most exciting things about this moment is that we can really think differently about how do we connect intelligently with people. We don't have to rely on waiting three weeks or three months or being lucky enough to be in that city to schedule a video meeting or meeting with someone in person. This is one of the most interesting times where the idea of having a quick video meeting can happen much more rapidly. Uh, and this moment is actually allowing many people to reach out and network differently, to build relationships that they may never have had before. And so I really encourage you to think about this moment in time and uh, think about really what are passions that you've always cared about mm -hmm. um, and who are some people that you'd like to connect intelligently with right now. Um, so right now for me, there is a Facebook group called Manhattan families who stayed. So people in New York that are staying in the New York that aren't leaving. And I can't tell you how amazing this group is for me right now, but that will continue to be for me um, as, as a mom, as a, a part of my community here in Manhattan that I never really had before this experience. Um, or say you're a dancer and um, you're loving the virtual Zoom dance classes uh, and you want to create a community around that. What are unique different things you could do now that you never could have done before? Because it would have been much harder to bring people together around the world on the screen. No, that, and that's, that is amazing. That is, all right, this, this is fantastic information and very actionable, which I know we all love, because we are itching to do things, right? We, we want to feel like we, action translates into difference making, although sometimes we thinking might not be as... Thinking might not be a bad idea either, but let me just share some of the gratitude with us. Shall we share, shall we relish in other people's gratitude in addition to our own for being together today? Okay, let's see. We have Joy, Joy Kurtz, who is amazing. Um, she said, I'm grateful I've made new friends through this pandemic. Always a wonderful thing to gain friends and family. Yeah. Love that. Um, Eliana, to be surrounded by positive thoughts. Hmm. Pretty cool. Um, here we go. Erin, how can I not read this? Erin, Erin's from the West Coast. Grateful for refresh. It's the perfect midweek reset for her, no matter the topic. Yeah. Right? So I guess, you know, there's something about the gathering that's really lovely. Heidi, Heidi says she is grateful for the, for, uh, grateful for the incredible support of friends. Yeah. Debbie Weiser. Hi, Debbie Weiser. We know Debbie. Yay. I am grateful the time to work on my physical fitness now. <laughs> I'm not commuting. 
Right? Yes. There's something to be said about that. Oh, okay. New with change comes innovation. And I think the big opportunity we have is to say, as we continue to evolve, are we going to revert back to old behaviors and norms? Or are we going to take some of the benefits of this moment and evolve with them? Um, I think we need to be, I, I think that's a question that we need to constantly ask ourselves because we need to keep it top of mind, which reminds us that we want to continue to innovate because it's so easy to drop back. Bridget is, um, Bridget was, is my friend from Ghana. Actually, Bridget ran for national office. She wants to help lead that country. Talk about a woman that is incredible. She is grateful for family and friends, relationships that are support systems. So we're hearing a lot about community and, con and connectivity. Chris is grateful for adversity because of which you find out who you really are and overcoming them. Hope, Hope McMath says she's grateful for being part of a transformational moment in our society. Let's create a new world. So she is actually speaking to you. By the way, Hope is a new world. She's not part of a transformation. She is leading every day. Um, astounding. Um, Heidi wants to know if you have any tips for dealing with negative thoughts and or inner critics during difficult times. Uh, this is a great question, Heidi. We all have negative self-talk um, and it comes and goes um, at many periods of our life. I mean, the reality is, is it starts with daily practices that are more that can more effectively help us break those negative thoughts because the negative thoughts will come uh, this morning when i was outside and it was 81 degrees and i started sweating after i took a shower negative thoughts just came up um, you know and um, but because i had done my gratitude journal in the morning because i had a practice um, that elevated me into a better state already, I was able to break it quickly and let it go. Uh, so that's the first one. Create, create the practices that can help you fight it. Um, the second uh, is anytime you're feeling that negative thought, ask yourself a question. What is the highest use of myself today? So sort of shift it. Um, and when you think about, okay, it's not that I'm sweating now after I showered and I'm outside. It's you know, my highest use today is to be of service to um, this community, to other events that I'm doing. And so you can sort of get out of it and get to a more positive state pretty quickly. Those are some tips, but if you have others, feel free to share them on Facebook and Zoom chat as well. Yeah, that would be helpful. So you, you started out, we started talking about how do I lead myself? And you gave these three incredible, and I love that fact that it's a, it's a little bite-sized pieces so we can chomp on them. In, in a time when there's a lot that feels overwhelming. How do I lead my team then? Like now, I'm now okay, I'm, I'm trying to get settled here. I have a team around me. I, you know, if you've heard me say anything, I believe life is a team sport. We don't do anything alone. Yeah. So whether it's a corporate team, business team, family team, like, I, like there's a lot of moms or dads on this phone or like, how do I deal with my kids who I'm so happy they're home, but. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if they went back to school for a little while. Yeah. So I, I've been doing a lot of work over the last three months around helping teams be dynamic and adaptable in this time of crisis. And, and I think this word adaptable is the real word because at first we thought, oh, this is a one month thing. This is a two month thing. This is a three month thing. And now we all know that this is a constant thing, a con you know, and, and so, a couple of tips now on how do we lead our teams, our groups, our communities, whatever, um, those that you're trying to serve, uh, whatever that community is for you. So um, some practical tips are, the first one is um, many of the teams that have been thriving right now have created what I'll call digital communication norms. So what does this mean? Uh, you know, we all have used digital tools before, but especially if you're on at working in an organization, uh, we have been thrown into using digital collaboration tools, whether it's Slack, Zoom, email, chat, text message, WhatsApp, what, you name it, in a much broader extent than ever before. But one of the things that's happening is people are dealing with overwhelm. People are overusing certain collaboration tools. They're sending too many emails that should be discussed in Zoom meetings. They're not being thoughtful in the meetings because they have so many meetings. Um, so in the next meeting, they're talking about what they discussed in the last meeting and beyond. And, and so one of the most effective things you can do right now 
is to gather your team because we've been in this moment for now three or four months and do a quick exercise. Ask them what have been the most effective, um, positive experiences we've had communicating digitally in these channels, whether it's the Zoom family group, um, the WebEx meetings, Slack, whatever it is. And then what have been some of the negative experiences? Where does tone get lost? Where do people get confused? Um, what do we feel has been kind of a waste of time? Perhaps scheduling three hour Zoom meetings when it's not actually the most effective way to do brainstorming in a remote working environment. And, and then use that to really define and set new best practice norms for how you'll work together. The second thing I'll share is if you're leading a team, show your vulnerability. Um, it's, it's more powerful to show what you don't know just as much as what you know. And we've always, um, with at Gen W talked about, you know, leading is not about authority. Um, it's about influence and you can do it at any level. Uh, but this is a really important moment to be willing to show your vulnerabilities and create space for others to feel like they can share theirs. One of the most exciting things that I've seen is that a lot of younger employees at organizations are teaching their executives, for example, yes. how to use Zoom or how to um, be more savvy in remote communication. Whereas executives are reminding uh, other employees, you know what, this is when you should call me versus this is when you should just send emails or post this on Slack. And, and so there's a great cross exchange of differences right now. And we should really harness that uh, to, to the utmost that we can. Uh, and then my, my third one is really uh, to th really think about how you can create a sense of psychological safety. Mm. in a virtual setting and tell us more about psychological safety so you know some of you may be familiar with the idea of psychological safety which is really um, not necessarily creating a space that feels safe but it's a, a because safe has a different connotation i would describe it as a space where people can feel comfortable sharing controversial and different ideas and feel like their ideas are heard respected acknowledged and valued um, with a sense and sharing around understanding, not contention. And, uh, you know, behind a screen, uh, my, my research over the last three years has been on the topic of digital body language and how we really connect intelligently in a digital world. And so COVID has sort of brought a lot of my research to light, but there's a research study called the online disinhibition effect, which shows that when we're behind a screen, Academically, we are our brains are wired to have less empathy for the other person. Uh, and even simple things like uh, when we're not making eye contact, when we deal with screen freezes, they actually have an effect on our brain of how much what we perceive from the other person. Similar to body language in a room where someone rolls our eye, rolls their eyes at us, or has a smile and a great handshake, and we feel really valued and respected. And, and so, you know, as you think about how you build psychological safety on your team, I'd encourage you to think about how are you enabling ways for people from different backgrounds to find their voice. Uh, so that really means people have different comforts. So if you look about at introverts versus extroverts, a lot of their styles are amplified online. So introverts, for example, are, are much prefer having agendas before meetings. They know what we're going to talk about. They're ready to speak. They like the chat button on Zoom because instead of feeling that they have to interrupt the extroverts who are always jumping in, they can share their ideas and chat. Uh, and one of the best things you could do is instead of asking open questions, ask people to share their ideas and chat and call on people based on the substance of ideas. So you're not repeating the same five ideas. Uh, extroverts really want that airtime. So, you know, their video meetings might be really important. Um, but my uh, dear friend that you also know, Donna, Mary Bell, who was a former executive um, at a, a large company, mentioned that she had a practice where when, after she had a Monday meeting with her team, she said, if you have another idea or a thought, send me it by email by Friday. And this creates a space where, you know, you don't have to have all the answers in the meeting. If you want to talk about something different or difficult, uh, there's an open line to continue communication. And so those are just some examples, but I'd encourage you to have that conversation with your team. Um, where have you felt like you've been able to speak up? In what environments? Um, what are the best examples? And where have you felt like you couldn't? 
And that might help you really design the most psychologically safe environment to talk about tough things on your team. All right, again, that is so much amazing information. I just want everyone to know, preparing to have this conversation with Erica, I had to give her and say, listen, sometimes I'm not going to have eye contact because <laughs> I, I learned about a lot of questions here. So I don't want to like disconnect and give the, you know, the message of I'm not being respectful or engaged. Ugh, but there's so much good information. I really do like the psychological safety thing. And I, I again, worth repeating. Um, because we do talk about this at Generation W all the time. It actually runs through all the work that I, am, I work on, which is leading isn't about authority. It's about influence. And we all have influence and you think about influence, even from a consumer markets point of view. And I, I saw the presentation you did about consumer market influence was in communication. It was brilliant. But who influences consumer purchases at like a 90 to 95% level? Women have so much influence, and yet we don't believe in our ability to lead. And, and connecting that, I think, is powerful. I, before you respond, let me just, if I could, say hello to a bunch of people. Debbie Banks is fantastic. She's with us. Say hi, Debbie. And Dr. Catherine, you know, Catherine, I'm going to say Dr. Catherine, but it's Metafari, I believe. Ann Flipsy uh, has been with us, and we just love seeing her all the time. Joanne Cohn, oh my God, she's here. We want to say hello to her, and Marilyn, and Marietta, and Ruby, and Trisha again. Um, and we had one more person that said, oh, let's say that they had offered another gratitude. I'll go back to gratitude if there's there. Thank you, Don, for your gratitude, but he left. Um, okay, that's quite good. Okay, so let's go back to how we can lead. And, and please send in your questions because I have tons of them, but as our expert just said, make sure we invite everyone. You can send them on the chat and you can put them in Facebook, whatever, and then they get, they get funneled into us and it really does make our conversation all that much more enriched and engaging. All right, so let me ask you this. You talk about being a digital, um, a dig digital body language. All right, so the girlfriends, and it could be whatever, I could be talking to my husband. Like, so what do we focus on? First of all, like, do I, is my hair clean? <laughs> right? Like, sometimes I will go on Zoom if I haven't washed my hair. Or maybe I do now and I don't care as much. Maybe our standards are down. Is it about our body position? It is about eye line. What are some of the things, if you can distill, that would help, that would help us in, in communicating? Or make us aware of things that would be helpful that we're not even sure we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first, what is digital body language? It's the basis of my research over the past five years and my book coming out next spring. So digital body language are the new cues and signals that we send in digital communication that make up the subtext of our messages. So this is not just about, for example, Zoom body language. Digital body language extends in all the different signals we send across all of the different outlets. So it's the choice of communication media. Did we choose to email, to text, to set up a Zoom meeting? Those are the new signals of priority. Did we CC, BCC, forward, reply all? These are the new signals of inclusion and exclusion right now. Did we use punctuation? Uh, research shows if you end a text message with a period at the end, roughly 50% of, of Americans think you're angry. Uh, did you respond in five minutes, in five days, in five weeks? Those are signals of urgency and in some ways respect for individuals, depending on the power level. Uh, I could give you 40 more uh, emojis. Um, did you use them? Did you not? Did people think they were friendly? Did they think they were immature? Uh, virtual backgrounds um, or your Zoom body language is another example of digital body language. Uh, but you can think about digital body language as extending in all the different signals and cues, not just of what we say, but how we say it. And I'll mention that it's not just about when we're behind a screen. Digital body language is also changing our traditional body language in a world where we're not going to do handshakes realistically in a room, in a world where we'll be distant, where we may be wearing masks so we can't see facial expressions, when we will have phones and PowerPoint screens in front of us. Uh, and so that, that's sort of a broad view of what digital body language is. I'm, I'm happy to share some tips, but, um, but I'll, I'll 
I'd love to hear from you, Donna, what's coming through your mind right now as I explained what digital body language is. That's so funny that you asked me because you must see my eyes like I am thinking. I'm thinking that we are creatures of habit. Right? And we resort to these habits. Our bodies slump in a certain way, our eyes, we're used to our hands, all of that kind of stuff. And by having masks and screens, now, we are now forced to reevaluate and rethink how we interact. And, we're, and so it's, it's actually creating new muscles. It's creating, I mean, I know a lot of people who have, are physically injured by their, I mean, we've all been in front of screens, but now it seems like there's this additional demand to be in front of a screen. So I, I, my friends have bad necks. They're going to the chiropractor. Your back is in a different way because it's the amount of hours. So I, I'm just kind of thinking through all of that as a, a new normal, if you will. That's right. And, and in many ways, for all of us that have relied on body language as roughly 75% of communication, which is what the academic studies show, now with 100% of our communication virtually and a lot of that body language even being, being affected in video meetings, we are reinventing, there's a whole new field of digital body language, I believe, that is going to be critical to leading our teams, engaging, building communities, in uh, and, and a few things that I've been seeing and I've been sharing in my, my client workshops and keynotes and, and in my book and newsletter uh, online has been the fact that reading messages carefully right now is the new art of listening. We can't rely on eye contact. It's not going to be perfect. We can't rely on the lean in or the handshake. Actually, you know, not rushing to respond, um, being thoughtful in our messages um, is actually valuing people. It's showing, I hear you. I'm coming to the meeting on time. I respect you. Secondly, writing clearly is the new art of empathy, actually. Really reading through our messages, I believe, is a critical writing and also speaking orally as well. Um, but it was much easier to be in a room with someone and show how much you care through your body cues. And we have to, I, I would call it up leveling. It's not that, you know, we didn't have to do this before, but it's even more important now written communication is when it comes to leading. And I, I would say in many ways that phone or video call is also worth a thousand emails, right? So we also have to know when to shift the mediums and when not to, because we're seeing a lot of emails, exchanges that should be meetings, and we're seeing a lot of meetings that are not necessary that should be emails. And so understanding how to switch the mediums is also an important part of the skill that we all need today. Right. I, I will tell you, like email is, email is a gift that keeps on giving till it kills you. Yeah. Right. I mean, literally, I can't tell you. I mean, all of us spend so much time and I think about like, is this the best use of my time? And yet there's a part of me that wants to see zero. Right. I don't want to see 647. It, it, it just runs against my nature. I need to get them all out and it doesn't work like that. But uh, let me just say this. You talked about, I'm going to make a little bit of a U-turn. And first of all, let me welcome everybody to Refresh. We have the amazing Erica Dewan, a communication specialist, author, keynote speaker, clearly brilliant thinker uh, and researcher about how we can communicate better, not only in real life. I know it's like, if this is real life, I can't say in real life anymore because this is real life. Anyway, in the new normal. Uh, she has a new book coming out called Digital Body Language. We've talked about leadership and digital body language, but I am going to, and we have a graphic, by the way, with some tips that we created, which was about cultivating co connectivity. But before I go there, you said something about this whole new field of digital body language. All right. One of the things that, I, that amazes me about you is that you created a new field. Now, we're, we're going to take this a little personal. So Erica is... The, pair, uh, the daughter of? Two Indian immigrant physicians. Great. And your sister? My sister is a leading infectious disease doctor uh, on the front lines in San Francisco. And my brother does cancer drug discovery, also in the sciences. Okay. So all of you now have had a good chance to, learn, to spend some time with Erica. You realize she's brilliant. She's accomplished. But Erica has been designated as the? Black sheep in her family. Tell us about that. And by the way, let me tell you also, Erica has three degrees. She went to Stanford, MIT, and 
Harvard, MIT, and Wharton. That's and Wharton. Okay. Um, really, um, you know, if you were had a poker hand, that would be a winning hand. It's a life hand, right? So these are incredibly exceptional schools. And yet, in your family, you have not been deemed as worthy as the, as the others. Is that possible? <laughs> you know, Donna, I, um, I was taught in my family um, that, you know, success really comes from checking all the boxes of success, of, of external success. And for my family, a lot of that was about education and um, either being a doctor or an engineer. And, you know, I think um, I'll, if I go back to my own experiences, um, when I was in high school, when I was 17 years old, and for those Gen W community members that are in high school, um, you know, Gen W is such an important community for you. Uh, you have to take advantage of it because when I was in high school, I went to a program and it was literally called Global Entrepreneurship. And it opened my eyes. For the first time in my life, I met global business leaders from around the world that um, had started businesses. And frankly, I had never met an Indian woman that wasn't a doctor or a housewife, let's be honest. Besides, you know, maybe a few people in my school that I didn't know very well. And when I could see the possibilities for myself, especially with other women that had done the same, I was able to dream of, of a new, a new possibilities for myself. And I hated science. I didn't want to be a doctor. And, and it really set me on a path. Then my senior year, I applied to Wharton undergrad. I got in. I learned a whole new world of um, the power of business um, and what we can do through business. And um, then I was also still stuck in checking the boxes of success. So I went to a, a top investment bank um, back in the early 2000s. And that bank was called Lehman Brothers. Ever oh, heard of it? Um, I worked through the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. And during that bankruptcy, I really had my own sort of pivotal moment again of, um, you know, what does checking all the boxes really mean? And why does it matter if we're not happy in our work? I was exhausted. Um, I had my, I'll, I'll, like literally this a similar Ariana Huffington moment where I fainted on the trading floor. And, and this was after the bankruptcy where I was still working there. And you know, my body was telling me I needed to get out. And it led me on a new journey to go back to school. Um, and while at that point, while most of my peers were going to McKinsey or the World Bank, what I really fell in love with was it, the question of it's not what teams do, it's how teams work. Because I had been in such a difficult environment at Lehman. And I got hooked on really the the importance of leadership and organizational change. And it really was following a thread more than a plan. But while I was a researcher at Harvard Center for Public Leadership, um, I began to ask the question really, how do we up-level uh, traditional leadership, which was really mostly written by old white men from the 90s, to a modern workplace, a workplace that's virtual, remote, global, multi-generational, matrixed. And, uh, that led me to writing my first book, which is really about shifting from emotional intelligence to what I call connectional intelligence. And now my second book uh, coming out next spring, sign up for my newsletter to hear more about it, which is really about up-leveling us from traditional body language to digital body language. So to summarize quickly, I think I never intended to be a black sheep. It was it was when I had the breakdown moments, unfortunately or fortunately, that allowed me to ask better questions um, and to really um, ask, not focus on external success, but what success looks like for me. And I'm still the black sheep, but um, I'm proud of myself. And my family has, has come across the line too, especially when they saw my book at Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to tell you, we're proud of you too. There was, there was so many great kernels of self-revelation there and also ones to help us relate. But when you speak about young girls and even speak about women, you said, oh, all of a sudden I saw possibilities. That is the work of Generation W and Generation WOW. Um, clearly, though, as, as a, you came from a family of privilege. Yes. And so when we think about this, and, we, and, we are, and I know you're just a big champion of this, is how do we expose all girls 
not only to what's possible, right? But that they believe it's positively possible no matter where you come from. And interestingly, that your very successful family, in a sense, handicapped your mind, yeah. gave you all the tools, but said like, wait, wait a second, this isn't the best direction. Now, often what we're finding is there are family, families, don't, you're even, they don't even have that head start. And so I just think it's important. That's why this community is so important, is to share with each other what's possible, no matter what room you're sitting in or how many dollars you have in the bank, that there is positivity and possibility in all of our lives, especially if we support each other. And I think that is a very powerful part of your message. In the end, um, I'll just say two things on top of that. One is, um, if we think about this moment in time and if we have access to Wi-Fi, we can build a community that we never thought possible despite our circumstances. So when I was in high school, when I was in ninth grade, I actually had severe depression and I never got it treated for it. Um, I wish I did, but I was able to overcome it over time. But um, I wish that I had a community, um, you know, mental health isn't something you discuss in Indian culture, really. Um, and I, I wish that I had a community to engage in. And one of the communities out there now um, is started by a woman named Nancy Loveland called Crisis Text Line, which is a text community for those that are looking for mental health support. Um, it started as a community for teens, so they could text in um, things that they were going through, challenges they wanted to face, and now it's grown to engage people around the world. And one of their largest segments is white men over 50 years old in the United States. I and understand so, that, actually. Right? So if you think about, um, I, I'd encourage all of us to think about this, you know, the, the possibilities right now with digital connection that were not possible um, before. And, uh, and that really require also a sense of community. And that's what Gen W and Gen Wow is doing. Uh, and I'm so grateful to you, Donna, for well, creating that space for all these women. Well, I appreciate that. And it, it actually, it's what we're thinking about is Gen W is going virtual on September 11th. Like where our minds are being exploded in, in many different ways. But let's go back and stay right here for a moment because we do have, we talked about um, cultivating connectivity. So we have three more like little tips that we can leave people with. Um, oh, it's cultivating superior connectivity. Number one, you, you talk about being clear instead of brief. Tell us about that, Erica. Yeah, so I have three key tips around really mastering connecting well in the digital world. So the first one is be clear instead of brief. So right now the pressure to communicate quickly is often leading a lot of us to take shortcuts or sometimes leave out context altogether. And I'll give you an example. One of my clients, uh, Adriel, has a teammate named Brian. And one Thursday night, she had an idea about a project that Brian's working on. So she sends him a no subject calendar invitation for the next morning for a meeting at 8 a.m. Brian comes on to the video meeting and it looks like he hadn't slept, he looks exhausted. Adriel says, I want to talk about the client project. Brian says, I thought I was about to get fired because there was no context and it was, you know, an immediate hour long meeting. And while that story may seem astronomical, in these times it doesn't um, because a lot of confusion can be created if we're not truly being clear in our messages. So think before you type, be thoughtful about it and it can make a huge difference. Should I go to number two? Well, before you go to number two, actually a question just came in that relates to this, which says, how do we make sure to communicate in a way that leaves little to be misconstrued, right? Texting and emails can easily be read in the wrong tone or context. I find this all the time. It's so funny. I'll say, well, I said this and I read it, go back and someone said, well, you said this. And I'm like, well, I didn't mean that. I, I, it's, it happens all the time. Happens all the time. And one of the ways I'd recommend, and it depends on who this is, if it's a teammate or a colleague, um, there are certain things that you can do that can help reduce the miscommunication. So one of them is create some norms around how you said, say, work requests. So I know one client is actually has a template that says who, what, when. So you're avoiding niceties. I really appreciate if you get this done maybe by Thursday or noon-ish, really vague, right? Um, instead, have you know, clear norms, say who, what, when, and, that, and that's what I need. Another thing you can do is create acronyms for your team. 
that help clarify brief messages. So one of my favorite acronyms um, are response time acronyms. So 2H means I need this in two hours or 4D means I need this in four days. And that reduces the endless follow-ups. And if they can't get it done in four days, they know when you would need it and they can get back to you and say, I can't do this, this is why, or let's break this down. Um, so really actually avoiding the niceties um, in, in, and focusing on norms around it can make a big difference. If it's someone that you haven't worked with or you're reaching out to, it may be harder to do that. I would just ask you in every message to think from their perspective and ask yourself, is it clear what my ask is, what the priority level is, how I'm, how I'm feeling about this? Um, and even just asking yourself those three questions when you send me messages can help you become more clear. That's great. And let me just add one other thing here because um, Joy sent in, when we're talking about body language being clear, um, she says, I think age defines digital body language too. For example, as a former English teacher, I am used to using periods at the end of sentences or exclamation points when I'm happy. So many of us need to learn these new abbreviations, right? So if she, she might be a person who puts with well intention a period at the end of her tweet or her text because it's right grammar and we're all thinking she's mad at us. Yeah. By the way, Joy's, Joy's not mad at anybody, but she is an English teacher, a principal of a high school, right? Absolutely. And I find that beautiful writers and English majors just go crazy with this. So I have a lot of empathy for them. Uh, I like to describe it not as age-based, but there's digital natives and digital adapters as maybe i'll describe it so people that sort of grew up in the aol instant messenger world of lots of lols or they know you know they think that multiple question marks is angry versus a simple question mark or they think that all caps um, feels like shouting versus for other people it can feel like excitement uh, and, and so, you know, the reality is, is there is a lot of confusion because we all have digital body language styles. And by the way, there are 42 year olds that only want to text too. So it's not just age based um, as well. And there are 28 year olds that want thoughtfulness written in the emails and not shorthand. Uh, and, and so I'd encourage, you know, you and your colleagues to really just have a conversation. Uh, and also check your biases. If you find yourself, and this goes into the third tip, making judgments, assume the best intent and actually confirm if your interpretation was correct before making a judgment or responding. So important. It's also like hold your horses. That they, they're definitely connected. Assuming the best intent, sometimes it's interesting, sometimes depending on who I'm working with, um, they feel like it's weakness. Right? Oh, let me assume the person's doing the right thing. No, no, no. It's, before you just jump in there, just figure it out. You can save a lot of time, energy, worries, all about that. But there is this need to like, oh my God, they said this. They meant this. Hmm. Hmm. Perhaps a breath or a pause or like, oh, let's just sit on that for a second. And we can do that for each other too, I assume, right? Sometimes like Sherry's our producer and she'll say, did you see this? And I'm like, I have or I haven't. Um, okay, let's just spend a minute. And she will do that for me. And that's, a, that's, that's very valuable. That is very valuable. Joy says she's never heard of digital natives before. She says, I'm definitely not one. <laughs> yeah, I like to define it as digital natives and digital adapters. And think of digital adapters are those that feel like working entirely in a digital context, it's like learning a new language, like they're immigrants to a new culture. Right, and, and, it, and it is a new culture. And what's so interesting is times move so fast that we actually thought the millennials were kind of digital natives, but what if, we, if we look at the Gen Zs now, they are true digital natives. And I'll just say, I know 51 year olds that are digital natives at heart too. Uh, and I know 28 year olds that are like, English majors, for example, that are like, why can't people just write and, and think before they write um, and use periods at the end? And so it really is sort of styles um, in the way that we have Myers-Briggs types too, but it's definitely, there's definitely generational angles to it. Right. There's, yeah, there are sometimes people, well, Hope's on, Hope is here and Hope is a magnificent writer. She elicits emotion and takes you on stories and puts you in places. She's fantastic. And I admire how people can really condense messaging 
in our short form formats, right? Whether it's Instagram or texting, um, even a tight email is good. Um, and I wish I could sometimes get to the essence quicker. Um, I don't know if that's being a digital native. It's just probably about understanding the medium and the message. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one last tip. I know we're almost out of time, which is to hold your horses. And what I mean by that is that less haste right now equals more speed. Don't rush to triggered responses. Actually create a culture on your teams with your groups where you're prioritizing thoughtfulness over being the fastest to respond. Don't re reward the fastest person. Reward the person that has thoughtful ideas and or different ideas and brings them to the table. I love that too. And you know, it's funny, just as you said, this, this popped up from Joanne Cohen. She said, humility goes a long way with all of this. We don't have to know everything, yay. This is pressure we don't need to own. Sometimes the digital medium increases stress with, with perfection, which is what you said, right? I have to get there first. I have to like really respond. But that's also tied to expectations. I worked in a company where the culture was, you responded like this. And I remember the first couple of times I was responding like this, I had an error, I had this, it went to the CEO and he was crazed by that. And I'm like, now, now it's like, I couldn't even type a letter without, like I was so nervous about it. And so this idea of holding your horses or what, Jen, uh, what Joanne's saying, um, trying to minimize stress is a good thing, but we also want to show respect and responsivity. So how do we balance that? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I think it's, it's understanding if it's a quick message that we can respond to, it's like a yes or no in 30 seconds, then do it. If it needs more complex thought, if it requires a, a big effort on your, your part and you can't do it in that moment, don't rush to respond and say, I agree. When you need to brainstorm, set up a time literally on your calendar to get back to it. Uh, and knowing, or if you know that this should really be a phone call or a video meeting, know when to switch the medium as well. And those are just simple tips. I also have a digital body language toolkit that I am oh. making available for free for all, all of my Gen W family members. Yes. Um, and so if you go to, we'll share the, the website link, but if you go to ericadewan.com slash DBL hyphen toolkit, and we'll put that up for you. Um, in the right, let's, let's, it, let's say that one more time. Erica Dewan. Dewan is spelled D-H-A-W-A-N. D-D-L. Uh, um, slash dbl hyphen toolkit uh, you can sign up and get access to it and what it includes is a digital body language style guide so it shares best practices in email in text in video meetings and phone meetings and it's a great tool that you can use for yourself but also to share with your colleagues um, as a way to really master and up our game around all the things that we talked about today that's awesome and i know jakimba said is very appreciative of this and a little uh, shout out to Jakimba. She just stepped down as um, the leader of the Southeastern region of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority, which is a huge, unbelievable organization committed to the well being of all of us in America. So I'm grateful to her for that. Um, the other thing I wanted, you said, I wrote, I, mean, I wrote a note newsletter. You said, hey, subscribe to my newsletter. We'll tell us hello. Yes. Um, so I also have a newsletter that you can check out. We'll send out the link after this, but it's bit.ly slash edewan. And you can, you can get the newsletter there. So, e so you know what we'll do is we send a thank you note to everybody and we'll Perfect. include all of this for you. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I'm all in. You have provided so much incredibly valuable, actionable information that not only will help me communicate better with myself so I can lead myself better, but with my team, I don't, my, my, a lot of my teams here, they're amazing. Um, I like this 2H4D thing. I think that's helpful. Your talk about introverts and extroverts. We have both. And sometimes I'm like, I want everybody talking. It's not happening. Like, and I leave thinking, how can I change this? And so you've given us, and especially me, some very actionable tools. I am thrilled for all of you who have joined us and for all of your comments and thank, and um, um, not only comments, but also your questions. I think it's all so helpful. So Erica, I'm just going to close out by telling everybody that um, here's a quote. I always like to pick a quote that somebody says. I love this one. Among many, I couldn't even write fast enough and I was losing my body language for you. So I was very concerned, right? <laughs> um, the question you like to ask, which is what is in my power? 
And the powerful thing to do and how to answer that is to realize you need to be here and be in the moment. Powerful. I'd like to remind everybody to save the date, September 11th. I think registration is just about open, I'm hoping. September 11th, it will be the magic of Generation W. We are going to be, actually we've spent a lot of time studying what Erica has shared with us about how do we embrace the power of technology to create the warmth, the connectivity, the learning, the love that is so a part of this community. I mean, we're doing it today, so you know that we'll be able to do it on that. So please put it, Put on your calendar. We promise that the fuel that lifts your spirit, your soul. Joy, you've never been to Generation W. This is your year. And it's so funny. That's what makes this so special. There's so many people who could not have come before can now join us. And we have amazing speakers. Um, Erica has been one with us in the past, and she will be again, I am certain. Um, for next week, we're so happy that we'll be having a great conversation with Deborah Levy, a certified business and life coach. Uh, she began her career at this collective up at Harvard, a teaching fellow, um, aligned with the specialized in, um, in the field of positive psychology. I know that being positive <laughs> and learning about positivity, even when the phone rings and you know it, somebody wants to ask you whether your car insurance is good, uh, happens, is really powerful for us. We look forward to Deborah joining us for next week. It's something we can all get refreshed about, I am sure. And next Wednesday, remember, next Wednesday, noon Eastern time. Oh, hello. This is real life happening. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Bridget, it's so joyful. It's just way to go, right from Ghana. Talk about digital connection, the silver lining. Of course, to our entire Generation W team, Sherry, our producer, Stacy, Jamie, Kasha, Christina, Tara, Elizabeth, and Mariah, who's our newest member. Of course, Ruth. To all of you for joining us, please keep spreading the word. There's a place to refresh in the world. A specific request again that seemed to work for this week. If you have a friend who think would enjoy, come, bring them along. If you need a link for Zoom, um, we're happy to have you join us through Zoom as well. All you have to do is send a note to info at genw.com, info at, and we'll send you a link so you can be part of the link um, community that we have. And by all means, stay in touch. We're here every day trying to do the best work we can to build community, lift each other's spirits, try to make a difference, um, highlight those that are making a difference like Trisha and, um, uh, and Hope and Joanne and, 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 and everyone. I mean, I feel like amplifying each other's work is, is something that we're responsible to do. It makes us all better. So remember, together we are powerful. Together we are not alone. Together we can be healthier, be healthier because I am still absolutely channeling Dr. Stephanie and Dr. Jack, Jackie, our friends from Mayo. Remember to save the date for Generation W. Remember to be with us next week. And remember to sign up for the newsletter for Erica Dewan and thank her for being such an amazing guest. Thanks, everybody.